Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas online public lecture series. Tonight's forum, Antarctic Animals, Tales from the Southern Ocean, is brought to you by the University of Tasmania as part of the Australian Antarctic Festival. As a reflection of our institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners of Lutrawitta, Tasmania, the Palawa people. The Palawa are the original and traditional custodians of the land in which we are broadcasting to you today. We pay deep respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Acknowledge their deep history of storytelling, knowledge sharing and caring for land. We are broadcasting across Australia and the world to many lands that were not ceded. If you would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which you are watching, I invite you to do so by entering it into our Q&A function. My name is Dr. Stuart Corning. I'm a senior lecturer in oceans and cryosphere, that's the frozen bit of the world, at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. My passion, and fortunately also the focus of my research at IMAS, is understanding how the global experiment we are running, where we alter our climate at a rate that is unparalleled in the last few million years, is impacting our society and the ecosystems that we are all a part of. My particular interest is Antarctica and the Southern Ocean and the marine ecosystems that this region contains. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand function have all been disabled to protect your privacy during this live broadcast. We encourage you to ask questions. This can be done at any time by typing into the Q&A function you see at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions anonymously if you wish. We will address as many of those questions as possible later in the session, but I encourage you to get in early as we don't always have time to address all the questions. We'll also conduct some polls during the webinar. We'd love to know who you are and what you think throughout the discussion, so fe please feel free to participate. This Island of Ideas series commenced in 2020 as a way of keeping our community connected when the university was unable to host face-to-face -face events. Discussion sharing, discussion sharing and creating ideas is an important part of university culture and is the reason they continue to host forums such as this. The Island of Ideas program continues in the hope that university can connect the ideas and people of Tasmania to a global network where we're able to collaborate and discuss emerging issues and work toward a brighter future for and from Tasmania. So I'm delighted now to introduce tonight's forum, Antarctic Animals, Tales from the Southern Ocean. This evening, we'll introduce you to a range of animals that live in the ocean and around Antarctica, discuss how they live and highlight the challenges they face now and into the future. We share these stories with you in the hope you'll appreciate the extraordinary lives of these creatures, but also to highlight the challenges they face. Many of us have experienced firsthand the human impacts of climate change, most recently through bushfires, flooding in Australia, unprecedented heat waves across Europe, and increasingly common typhoons and hurricanes around the world. But climate change is not just a challenge for humans and not just where we choose to live. It's a global challenge, and some of the largest impacts are being felt in the remote regions most of us will never visit. Today, we're going to share with you how climate change is being experienced in the Southern Ocean, where the choices that you and I make, you and I make are having a lasting impact on animals who have no voice to stand up for the future of their children or their children's children. So how is climate change impacting the Southern Ocean? Well, as with everywhere on Earth, that impact has been significant. However, unlike much of the surface, much of the world, the surface temperature of the Southern Ocean does not warm significantly. Showing you here this figure, it's in Fahrenheit, I know, which is annoying, but this shows the change in temperature per decade over the last 30 years. And you can see that pretty much everywhere in the world has had warming except the Southern Ocean region. But this lack of change hides a trend that causes Southern Ocean scientists, like those of us speaking tonight, 
significant concern. This concern is around sea ice. Sea ice is different from icebergs. It's also very different from glaciers, ice sheets, and the stuff that covers Antarctica. This technically is land ice. Sea ice is frozen seawater. You can see it here in the pictures, the Noyina, on both sides, they're breaking through heavy sea ice and broken up sea ice. The thing about sea ice is that in Antarctica, it pretty much comes and goes every year. The animation in the middle shows how much sea ice there is each month over a couple of year period there. You can see in summer it almost disappears, in winter it comes back again. In fact, the area of the Southern Ocean that is seasonally covered in sea ice each year is larger than all of Australia. The thing then is just how much sea ice forms each year and remains over the summer is decreasing. That's shown here in this top figure where we've removed the annual trend and we can just see how it changes month to month. And you can see for a lot of the time over the last 30 years, 40 years, it's been sort of wandering around the mean. But then the last five years, it's been this significant decline and we've seen a lot less sea ice in the Antarctic since about 2016. This drop then is consistent with a warming climate. That means less of the ocean is freezing and the ice that does form, forms later in the year. The maps at the bottom then show both the current 20 year mean sea ice extent for March and September, well, September and February, sorry, for, for now on the left, and what we think will be the case by the end of the century on the right. You can see that by the end of the century, there will be less sea ice, especially in summer. It won't all have gone, but there will be less of it. Sea ice presence or absence then, and when it forms and melts, plays a critical role for so much of life in the Southern Ocean. As we'll soon learn from tonight's speakers, the changing environment is just one of the ways that climate change is impacting the animals that live in this part of the world. I'd now then like to warmly welcome our speakers for this evening. First, we'll hear from Dr. Jamie Cleland, a researcher from IMAS at the University of Tasmania and a fisheries scientist at the Australian Antarctic Division. Next will be Dr. Davy Vatia. Davy recently completed a PhD at UTAS at IMAS and is now a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for the Synthesis and Analysis of Biodiversity in France. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Virginia Andrews Goff, a marine mammal research scientist, the Australian Marine Mammal Centre of the Australian Antarctic Division. So, Jamie, first up. Jamie's day job, as I said, is as a fisheries scientist, where her research supports evidence based conservation and management of the Southern Ocean fisheries. However, she has a secret identity. She's also <laughs> focused on understanding how external stresses such as fisheries, invasive species, and climate change are impacting populations of albatross species. Tonight, she's going to tell us a tale about those albatross species that fly all over the Southern Ocean. The albatrosses, like these Tristan albatross, gather in numbers on tiny Southern Ocean islands to form elaborate and spectacular court displays. Often the pair will dance awkwardly around each other, bowing and clattering their bills with wings outstretched. And at the end of the performance, they will often point their bills to the sky and scream loudly. <laughs> so it's on these small, isolated rocks in the sea, often nearby productive ocean currents, that the males start to build the nest. And before the breeding begins, the population, well, during the breeding, the population takes place after the nest is built. The female initially occupies the nest to lay her egg and then heads out to sea, hungry and looking for nearby prey, leaving the male to take the first incubation shift. When the egg hatches, <laughs> the chick is guarded for the first few weeks until the demand to deliver food increases and both parents have to head to sea, returning independently to feed the chick. 
Left alone at the nest, the chick grows really fast, losing its down and developing its adult flight feathers. But as the duration between feeds gets longer and longer, the chick gets really restless and starts to build the chest and wing muscles required for life flying at sea. So whether or not that egg hatches or this chick here fledges from the nest is influenced by how well the parents can maximise energy intake while being constrained to foraging quite close to the breeding colony. So success is therefore dependent on how well an albatross can exploit its environment. So here we see the supreme aeronautics of the sooty albatross using dynamic soaring to harness the energy stored in the wind, allowing it to cover extreme distances. So if you can actually see the wind in this video, what you'd see is it shearing across the top of the swell, pushing these lighter down drafts down the face of the swell and some up drafts up the other side. So by riding these drafts between the swell and then turning their full underwing area into the wind shear, albatross, they gain this huge momentum and expend almost no energy in flight. So it's these um, strong, predictable westerly winds in the Southern Ocean that albatross rely on to travel fast and along directed routes to these poor foraging areas where they engage these slower wandering search patterns to find food. And the tracking of albatrosses has revealed to scientists that these foraging areas are usually related to features that actually aggregate prey. So here we see like a single Tristan albatross visiting highly productive sea mounts that drive upwellings and support large abundances of squid, which come closer to the surface of the water at night. So even in the deep open ocean, features such as frontal zones where colder and warmer water collide and swirling eddies exist, nutrients are brought to the surface and support productivity and abundant prey. So here we can see the currents associated with the Antarctic polar front. It's an invisible line in the Southern Ocean, but one that uh, us seabird observers working on the Aurora Australis would always eagerly anticipate. And even though the albatrosses require stronger and more consistent winds than those that can be found around the marginal ice zone um, around Antarctica, the, the Antarctic krill that's really abundant in this area is a key dietary component of the light-mantled albatross. But how well will these albatrosses adapt when strong winds, the productive frontal zones and the predictable ice dynamics of the Southern Ocean change? Well, that answer really will be different for each species because each species has different morphology, different breeding behaviors and different foraging strategies. So it's these differences that have the strongest influence on their vulnerability to climate change. And as scientists working to inform conservation action, one of the first steps for us is to understand vulnerability. So how do we do this? Well, one way is through long-term monitoring of populations and banding studies that allow us to follow individuals throughout their lifetime, analyze trends across that population, and then link those trends to climate-driven changes. So in these studies, individuals are banded with a unique band number, which are read annually. And uh, so we know when breeding begins, we know who breeds with who, who is successful at incubating an egg, and who is successful at rearing a chick. But what can this information tell us about resilience to climate change? So one great example comes from the Falkland Islands where researchers found that years of warmer sea surface temperatures had higher divorce rates amongst black brow albatross with an average of around 4% in normal years and up to 8% in warmer years. Um, the higher temperatures were actually linked to reduced food av availability near the colony, so driving that divorce rate. So in um, socially monogamous species, divorce is a, a strategy that's used to kind of correct for suboptimal partnerships. Uh, and that um, is informed by previous breeding performance. So if there's a failed breeding attempt previously, we would expect a higher chance of divorce. But interestingly and worryingly in this study, females that had previously been successful, so had optimal partnerships, were still more likely to switch partners in warmer years. 
showing that climate change may actually still even affect the most resilient individuals in the population. So when we combined uh, our banding data with some tracking information, questions about how local conditions in foraging areas, um, how they affect breeding can be answered. And we saw this done really well um, and, and how powerful this kind of research can be uh, at the Crozet Island. So where 40 years of banding data and tracking data from wandering albatross has shown that they have actually altered their foraging in response to changes in wind patterns. So climate change has seen westerly winds in the Southern Ocean increase in intensity and move poleward. So here the foraging range of wandering albatross has shifted poleward in conjunction with those changes in wind patterns. And at the same time, their flight speeds increase. So consequently, the duration of foraging trips decreased, breeding sex success improved, and the birds actually increased in body mass by more than a kilo. However, these, po these positive effects, they, there's no guarantee that they're gonna last into the future. So advancing research to integrate tracking and banding data for multiple species within a commu community allows responses to climate-driven changes to be compared and contrasted. So we can find out who the winners are and who the losers are. And it provides this comprehensive understanding of relative vulnerability of each species, um, such as uh, these ones you can see here that uh, inhabit Macquarie Island. So I want to leave you tonight with a, a good news story about uh, these Macquarie Island albatrosses that shows how research focused on an understanding multiple components of the ecosystem for a community of species gives us more options for the management um, in the face of climate change scenario. So for my PhD, I investigated the influence of trawl and longline fisheries, invasive rabbits and climate drivers on the survival and breeding success of four species of albatross found on Macquarie Island. And I found lots of things, but one of the strongest signals was uh, that periods of highest rabbit damage coincided with climate-driven extreme rainfall events, leaving young chicks sodden and with a lower chance of survival and parents with an exceptionally low breeding success. However, <laughs> so however, the good news is that the rabbits were removed from Macquarie Island over a decade ago, and now the vegetation is thriving, providing chicks on the nest with better protection this research has um, been able to show uh, how successful island eradications could have positive outcomes for albatross. And it, and it really shows how when we investigate climate impacts along with other pressures, um, so like invasive species and fisheries, we can really increase our options for conservation action in the response to climate change. Thanks, Jamie. Um, for those of you who have questions, please note you can address the panel through the Q&A function. You can do this at any time throughout the evening. You will have heard Jamie mention krill as part of an albatross diet. In fact, krill make up a significant component of the diet of a great many animals in the Southern Ocean and are an amazing critter in their own right. Our next speaker, Davey Vatia, uses a combination of observations and understanding of the biology of krill and computer modeling to explore how these fascinating creatures are impacted by their environment, such as sea ice cover, and how the changing sea ice I discussed earlier may lead to changes to their population in the future. Davey. Thank you so much, Stuart. So one of the first things you mentioned when introducing krill is that there's a lot of them. In fact, they're one of the most abundant multicellular species on the planet by biomass. They're also incredibly charismatic, and they even have their own computer animated movie character. I know, he's so cute. And in addition to that, and their movie career, krill also play a critical role in the Southern Ocean ecosystem. If an ecosystem is like a natural machine where groups of species play different roles in making the larger machine function, then krill are kind of like the fuel that keeps everything running. 
They're the primary prey source for many conservationally important top predators. And they're also important in cycling nutrients throughout the ecosystem. In many ways, krill are irreplaceable. So clearly, krill seem to have it all. Why should we concern ourselves at all with them? They seem very resilient. But this all boils down to climate change. So as Stuart mentioned, we can tangibly see the effects of human-driven climate change and the effects that it's having on the landscapes around us. And by comparison, the ocean just looks vast. It's homogenous and unchanging with quiet depths below the surface that seem really disconnected from all the emissions that continue to enter our atmosphere. But the ocean isn't a big, well-mixed bathtub of water. It's diverse. It's its own world and it's characterized by landscapes of changing temperatures and salinity, of canyons, mountains, and ephemeral bloom blooms of phytoplankton that then attract swarms of krill and other higher predators. So the story that I wanna to tell today is about this landscape, the underside of the Southern Ocean sea ice and its impacts on Antarctic krill. If you look at the distribution of Antarctic krill, and here you can see the lower densities of krill in blue, moving towards higher densities of krill in red. And then you look at the maximal extent of winter sea ice here on the right, you can kind of think that they sort of go together and that there might be some sort of relationship going on. The maximal extent of winter sea ice seems to be a pretty good match for the maximal extent of where we find krill. So are krill dependent on sea ice in some way? And if so, what does this mean looking forward into the future? That is the question that scientists are trying to ask right now. We have so many ways of measuring this, and one of them is to go down underneath the ice with cameras. And this footage has revealed to us that larvae actually feed on the algae that grow on the underside of the sea ice. Oh wait, that's not the right picture. I meant that's more realistic. Um, and also from analyzing their diet, we can see that larvae seem to be more dependent on sea ice algae than the later life stages. So if the height of the bar is how dependent the different life stage is on algae in the sea ice, you can see that the bar for larvae is the highest. So this indicates to us that sea ice provides a critical food source to larvae and that the amount of sea ice available directly affects larval survival every winter. But this story is more complicated. It's probably not just about how much ice there is every year because not all ice is created the same. So ice of a certain thickness can actually affect how much light from the surface reaches the bottom of the ice for algae to grow. And also ice that's broken up and deformed, it can create more pockets for larvae to shelter from predators and currents. So the footage playing on the screen is from a voyage in 2013 that went into the marginal ice zone. And it showed that actually, the ice found in between the dense pack ice and the open ocean, which is called the marginal ice zone, may be the most important for larval krill. And this is because here, ice can form horizontal slabs that act as little terraces. And it's in these terraces that larvae like to feed and hang out on. And actually, when I told this to my new French colleagues, they got quite a good laugh out of this because they were like, of course, terraces are important for life. So during my PhD, I used this information to try and estimate regions of the sea ice that may be important for larval krill survival. So in this figure, the red hexagons show where in the summer, we observe krill larvae that have successfully survived the winter. These hexagons also mark population centers for krill that then support dependent populations of predators, as well as an important region for the Antarctic krill fishery. So in this research, we assumed that krill were transported via ocean currents throughout the winter, so that their journeys into these red hexagons are approximated by these yellow arrows, which you can see here. And then the orange shading around these yellow arrows shows where having continuous access to sea ice habitat might be important, 
which pretty much occurs all along these transport highways. So habitat availability increases when the marginal, the marginal ice zone is present and when the thickness of sea ice is just right. It's not too thick and it's not too thin so that sea ice algae underneath can thrive. Currently, we don't know whether larval krill actually follow these transport highways over winter. So that's something that we'll need to further test in the field. So what does this all mean for the future? Well, at this point, it's a little difficult to say. Our best projections tell us that overall sea ice will decline, which could mean less habitat for larvae to survive the winter and less krill overall. Changes to krill populations would have profound consequences for the Southern Ocean ecosystem, including all the predators that feed on krill, such as penguins, flying seabirds, pinnipeds, such as seals and whales. Perhaps the sea ice decline could be mitigated in some, by some of the remaining sea ice improving in quality. Perhaps there might be more marginal ice zone or more overrafted ice and more terraces. Or maybe larvae will be able to adapt and find other ways to survive the winter. Or maybe climate change refuges, where the impacts of climate change are not so severe, will allow larvae to persist. So I said I was telling a story, but really, this is all just a small chapter. There are so many other environmental drivers to consider when trying to understand climate change impacts on Southern Ocean animals such as changing temperature, ocean acidification, primary production, and the timing of seasonal events. With such a big, complex nat natural experiment like climate change, it's difficult to foresee all the impacts that could manifest. If we wait too long for them to manifest, it might be too late to act. And right now, we can still act. So, Th thank you so David. much, Stuart. Yeah, thank you very much. And as an avowed krill lover, I hope you've all have an increased appreciation and understanding of the vital role this charismatic little creature plays in the Southern Ocean. We've got a few questions coming through in the chat. Feel free to put some more up there, though, and we'll address them after our final speaker. So now, Dr. Virginia Andrews Goff. Commercial whaling in the Southern Ocean pushed most whale species at the brink of extinction with over 2 million whales killed across the Southern Hemisphere in just one century. Virginia then works with a team of marine mammal research scientists, the Australian Antarctic Division, to determine how whales use and respond to their environment. This information is critical for Australia's conservation and management efforts, both domestically and through the International Whaling Commission, as well as management of the krill fishery through the Conserva Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Virginia. Thanks, Stuart. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. So this is a video of me bouncing around deep in the Southern Ocean, attempting to place a satellite tag on the largest animal that has ever lived, the Antarctic blue whale. And this is because satellite telemetry is my tool of choice to generate data streams that are critical to the conservation and management of whales. And that's because satellite tag derived data gives us the where, the when, the what, and the why, all the Ws of whale movement. I've got an example for you. This is an animation of our humpback whale satellite tracking data set. It shows our humpback whales moving along the east and the west coasts of Australia from their breeding grounds down to their Antarctic feeding grounds. The where and the when of their movement is immediately apparent. And that's fantastic for looking at things like overlaps with threats in both space and time. With a little bit of extra work, we can get at the what of the movement. So we can look at these fast, straight sections of track and distinguish them from the slow and more convoluted or squiggly sections of track. And this gets at the underlying behaviour of the whale. In this particular case, the underlying behaviour being transit or migration and search or foraging. And then with a little bit of more work, we can get at the why of the movement. Why do whales do what they do in certain areas? What is it about these areas that whales find more appealing? So whales are pretty impressive. 
everything they do is just a tad too large to comprehend. And this includes their size, the amount of prey they consume per day, so how much krill they eat, and their significant seasonal movements or their migrations. Now, migration has evolved as a really successful strategy to manage environmental variability, and it's persisted over millions of years. For whales, migration links their specific needs on their breeding grounds to their productive feeding grounds, which are usually located close to Antarctica and usually contain masses of krill. Now, what you're looking at here is the East Coast tracking data set. And what you're looking at here is the what of the movement. So if you recall, the what of the movement in this particular case is the more convoluted squiggly lines that indicate foraging or search behaviour, and those are the areas in red on this map. But we wanted to get to the why of the movement. Why do whales get all squiggly in these little red regions? And we did that by taking a look at the components of the environment in these areas in red. So basically, we're looking at the components of the environment through which these whales move through, things like ice concentration and bathymetry and chlorophyll. And what we very convincingly found was that the key predictors of search or foraging, or that squiggly red behaviour, were linked to the dynamics of the marginal ice zone, which Davies so nicely spoke a lot about. But just to recap, the marginal ice zone is that area of transition from dense pack ice to no ice cover at all. And it's really important for the whale, to the whale's primary prey source and their favourite food, Antarctic krill. This is the movements of the West Coast population, so our West Coast humpback whales. And the why of the West Coast humpback whale movement is quite different to the why of the East Coast humpback whale movement. In fact, it has very little to do with ice. These West Coast humpback whales target a region called the Southern Kerguelen Plateau, which is on that larger map there towards the south, that little label SKP, is equal to the Southern Kerguelen Plateau. And this is because in this region, the fronts, the, the shape of the seafloor basically pushes these fronts and currents northward quite sharply and then around into this little loop, which hopefully I'm pointing out with my cursor for you. And that little loop traps productivity and creates a prey patch that persists through time. And in fact, not only does this prey patch persist through time, but we think this prey patch is quite predictable because when we go back and look at the whaling data, we can see that humpbacks historically used this same region. I'd like to take a moment now to contrast the humpback whale and its movements, the humpback whale perhaps being the epitome of the whale that moves between warm breeding grounds and cold feeding grounds, with another whale we're pretty familiar with that visits our waters seasonally, the southern right whale. Now, we've been super fortunate to be able to collaborate on an incredible project with Associate Professor Emma Carroll out of the University of Auckland. Emma's been tagging southern right whales on their uh, subantarctic breeding grounds in the Auckland Islands, just south of New Zealand, and she's tagged them for the last three winters. Now, hopefully from this map, you can see that southern right whales aren't so north-south oriented in their movement, like the humpback whales. And in fact, Emma refers to them as wanderers because they seem to inhabit this space in between where the east and the west coast humpback whales go. Now, this data set is still accumulating, data is still coming in, so we haven't yet done the analyses to properly link this movement to the environment. But from these tracks, we already know that southern right whales depart the Auckland Islands subantarctic waters in what looks to be a westerly loop where they head up towards Australia and hang out just south of Australia in a region called the Subtropical Convergence Zone. Now, the Subtropical Convergence Zone is an area of increased productivity where waters of subtropical origin meet waters of subantarctic origin. And in this region, southern right whales are feeding on copepods. So they spend some time feeding in this area and then they go in this nice big loop right back around to where they started from in the Auckland Islands but sometimes via the ice edge where they will switch up their prey and feed on Antarctic krill. So 
So while we don't have the humpback whale level of understanding around the why of their movement, at least for this particular data set, for the other southern hemisphere, southern right whales, we already have a really clear signal that the changing marine environment is impacting their reproductive success and survival to the point where population recovery may be hindered. So hopefully I've now convinced you somewhat that whales are pretty in tune with their environment. The big question is, can they adapt when their environment changes, especially if that change is rapid? And there is some evidence to suggest that they can. By adapting their migratory patterns or seasonal movements, whales be, may be able to accommodate changing sea ice patterns and prey availability. Now we already see this happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Some of the Northern Hemisphere whale species are actually remaining in areas that they would previously migrate away from over winter because they can. And some species have shifted their seasonal movements to adjust to earlier prey availability. Another key behaviour may be dietary flexibility, which is the ability to switch prey or to take advantage of supplementary feeding opportunities. Now, our East Coast humpback whales are fantastic at this. They stop in temperate waters off Tasmania and the south coast of New South Wales and New Zealand, and they have a little snack on their way south. And we think that this behaviour has actually become more common as the population has expanded, or at least the numbers have grown. For southern right whales off South Africa, a shift in range northwards paired with a change in their prey base away from Antarctic krill and towards copepods has unfortunately come at a reproductive cost. So will flexibility in movement and foraging be enough? Climate change is one of the multiple pressures on recovering whale populations. Fishery gear interactions causing bycatch and entanglement are perhaps the main stressor to whales globally. And the other non-climate stressors include vessel strike and ocean noise. Now, originally conservation and management of whales came about due to the devastation caused by commercial whaling. Today, the impact of these multiple non-climate stresses combined with or even multiplied by the impacts of climate mediated change mean that the ongoing management of protection of whales is just as necessary now as it ever was. Thanks, Virginia. In your discussion around the different behavior of the humpbacks from the east and west coast of Australia really illustrates that influence of environment on, on the creatures. For those of you who have questions, please note you can put them in the panel, Q, the Q&A function. Some of the good, great ones are coming in and we'll get to them in a second. So I'd like to invite now all our panelists to join me as we turn to those questions. As we just saw, the panelists shared stories that show how changes in the physical environment in the Southern Ocean will impact behavior and healthy outcomes for animals in this region. Ultimately, these behavioural changes are likely to lead to change energetic requirements, which then impact reproductive success and ultimately population. But now we're interested in what you think. Go to the first question. It's for you, Davey. So the question is simple. To what are krill predators? What do they eat? The primary prey source we think about for krill are phytoplankton. So those are basically tiny little plants in the ocean. And so if you've heard that, um, that saying where if you take two breaths, one of those breaths comes from the ocean sources of oxygen, that's being produced by all those phytoplankton. Um, krill are also very adaptive though. So there's more evidence coming out that krill can switch to other prey sources as well when there's not a lot of phytoplankton around, such as during the winter. So we actually see sometimes swarms of krill close to the seabed, um, feeding on sources of food down there, feeding on detritus. So they can actually be quite adaptable. Thanks, Davey. A lot of our questions coming in now are about whales, probably to do with Virginia's excellent talk and some of those excellent footage. Don't forget about the albatrosses though. If you have questions on the birds, get them in there now. So Virginia, first one for you. We've been asked around, you, I saw as well, that, uh, that humpbacks are actually feeding in Bass Strait and other areas, and you mentioned that as well. So the question really is, are there 
any animals, are there any humpbacks that feed solely in Australian waters or in the temperate waters and therefore avoid making that long journey south to Antarctica? Would this be advantageous for their energy expenditure? So really, is there enough krill? Well, the, the question asks krill, krill, I know the answer. Is there enough krill within these waters to sustain a population of humpbacks in Australia? Look, there are a lot of humpback whale populations moving through the coastal waters of Australia. And what's really interesting and, and what I didn't mention in my talk is that we don't have a lot of evidence that the West Coast humpbacks do what the East Coast humpbacks do. So within our tracking data sets, we routinely pick up this supplemental temperate feeding by East Coast humpback whales. And there have been some stable isotope analyses on baleen whale plates, which indicate that this has happened at least uh, historically for East Coast humpback whales, but West Coast humpback whales seem to have a single prey source, Antarctic krill. So there are a component of, we think there's a component of whales that are more likely to hang around and feed and not migrate, and that's the young ones. I think um, anyone who works on whales on whales, on animals in general, knows that the young ones are a little bit wild. They do their own thing for a little while. Not just animals. <laughs> and so, you know, like they're perhaps the ones that stick around all summer, all the time in Tassie waters, there seem to be a few, are the young ones. And, in fact, there's um, some research happening by Dr Madeline Brazier out of uh, UTAS, out of IMAS, that's actually looking at this. So we should know more over the next few years. Thanks, Virginia. I've got a, a follow-up question, I guess, from Lauren. She asks, how many whales are there currently? And I guess that is around how many were there then how many did we hunt and how have they come back? Look, as a general rule, you can say most of the whale populations were reduced down to just a few hundred individuals. It's quite phenomenal how many whales were removed from the Southern Ocean during industrial whaling. Um, at the moment, humpback whales are going incredibly well. So they've recovered to um, basically they're at or near their pre-whaling numbers, which is very roughly around 30,000 off the east coast of Australia and 40,000 off the west coast of Australia. Our numbers are quite outdated now. So it's, it's hard to know, but it really is up around those incredibly high numbers. It is great. It's, it's been a conservation success story, I guess, the return of humpbacks, but it's not the same for all species, is it? It's not the same for all species. In fact, it's not the same for all humpbacks. So our neighbouring population over in Oceania, they're not recovering as well as our east and our west coast humpback whale populations. And in fact, um, their status is still uh, at threatened or endangered. It's still fairly low. Um we also have two populations of southern right whales that visit our waters, the southeast population and the southwest population. The southwest population is going really well, the southeast population not so well. So, you know, like there are varying levels of um, recovery across a lot of the populations of whales. Thanks. Okay, Jamie, one for you then. This comes from Chelsea. With increased divorce rates in the albatross birds in both successful and unsuccessful breedings, Will this impact the raising of chicks if there is no assurance of maternal or paternal influence? Uh, so the reason um, albatross have these long-term mating partnerships is because there's a lot of benefits with sticking with the same partner. So there's this experience uh, and learnt behaviour of when to turn up. So you're not sitting there at the nest and, and waiting uh, uh, foolishly for a bird that's not going to return. So you've got that experience and knowledge in that partnership at the timing of returning to the breeding colony. Um, and there's also that real cost of um, finding a new partner and building those uh, breeding behaviours and the dancing and that that partnership. So, um, yeah, I think. What, what I'm getting at is that um, it's it's much better for those partnerships to last a long time. And, and what that generally results in is 
a better breeding quality of individuals. We know as albatross get older, they don't um, breed as successfully. Um, so having those long-term partnerships and that stability around a stable environment um, results in higher breeding success. So it, it could potentially then higher divorce rates lead to less successful outcomes from a population. Broken yeah, that's, homes affect everyone. That's correct. Well, I, we've, I've got a, a, another question, of course. <laughs> we've already mentioned a couple of different types of sea ice. We mentioned pack ice. We talked about the marginal ice zone. Davey, I'm going to give it to you. How many different types of ice of sea ice are there? What are the different names of sea ice? So great question, because I think when you asked me this question at the beginning of my PhD, it was in front of a lecture room of a bunch of undergrads. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so working from the open ocean where you have no sea ice and working in towards increasing concentrations, you have the marginalized zone, which we've talked about. It's kind of that intermediate stage. And here the ice is perturbed by a lot of ocean swells, so it can be more dynamic. As the ice concentration starts to increase, you get into the pack ice. And here the ice is more stable. And then you also have sea ice that is kind of fastened to the shore. So if you've watched ice cubes freeze in your freezer, you'll notice that the ice tends to form on the outside first. It kind of anchors to the outside of the ice cube holder. So that's kind of like fast ice where it's anchored to the land. Excellent. Did I get all of them? <laughs> You've learned so much, I'm so proud. <laughs> Great one. Many more questions coming in. Let's go through a few more of them. Virginia, do the, this is, it's an anonymous question. Do East and West Coast whales mix or do whales change from one migration pattern to the other? Or is it like West Side Story? Yeah, there's some genetic evidence to suggest that there is a little bit of mixing. So uh, for a very long time now, we've managed um, the East Coast and the West Coast population as separate breeding stocks. But when they head down to their feeding grounds, there is some mixing. So there's some mixing on the feeding grounds. In fact, one of our satellite tag tracks, one of those animals does this wayward thing where everyone along the east coast spins off towards New Zealand or travels south past Tasmania, and then there's this one whale that heads across the Bass Strait to the west and zigzags its way westerly to Antarctica, just this one tag. So, yep, there are mixes, random mixes in all populations, I think. There's always one. We know that. Keeping with the whale, well, maybe this is not a whale question, actually, from, from Kirsten. What do we know about orcas? Have we found many orcas changing their behaviour or becoming more prominent in the study areas as humpbacks adapt to climate change? So when we talk about the natural predator of whales, often we talk about humans, but, of course, orcas are pretty um, effective predators when it comes to whales, mostly smaller whales or calves. There's been a lot of work off Western Australia on the way um, orcas target blue whales, for example, and humpback whales. Um, this isn't a signal that we can pick up in our satellite tracking data, so it's not necessarily a question I can answer, but certainly orcas are uh, a significant predator of whales in that they're quite effective. They're not taking a huge number of whales out of the population. I, I think if anyone's watched any Attenborough, they would have seen the incredible footage of what orcas can do to whales. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, one for you, Jamie. Um, it's just disappeared off my screen. How... This is a question around the uh, albatrosses and flying. And the first question, how do they survive the cold? And then is it true that albatrosses can, can basically fly forever? <laughs> wow, good questions. Um, so I think I just wrote that, you know, the, the albatrosses under their uh, larger external feathers, they have these really tiny, fluffy, downy feathers, and they're super, super dense. So it's like this amazing insulation around the body that keeps them super warm. 
that but that doesn't help them necessarily incubate an egg um, when they're keeping their warmth in their internal bodies. So what they have is this um, patch of bare skin under their belly called a brood patch. And that bare skin connects the heat of their internal temperature body to the egg and warms that egg and keeps it warm um, over the, the span of the incubation until it hatches. Um, so that's how they keep warm. And how they fly? Well, um, they've got these huge wings uh, and that big wing area allows them to capture uh, the wind and gives them quite a lot of lift. Um, for seabirds, they're quite heavy. So they've got these big chests and that, that weight in their body actually combined with these huge wings means that they have a really, really long glide ratio. So that's the, um, the glide ratio is how far you fall um, across uh, a certain distance. So if you've got a big glide ratio, you're falling not very much over a really long distance. And so albatross use those wings, those big wings, use the strong winds of the Southern Ocean to travel really, really long distances uh, without even flapping. Uh, there are hundreds of research papers written by um, aeronautical engineers studying the flight of albatross. And they theoretically say that albatrosses can fly over 15,000 kilometres without flapping their wings. So, um, of course, when the winds are calm, there's a lot of flapping to be done and when they have to land and find food uh, and take off again a huge amount of flapping but um, theoretically they can fly yeah 10,000 miles 15,000 thanks Jamie that actually relates to a question someone asked about our poles uh, the poll question was how far can you know can an albatross fly and I trying to find it there it is how far can a wandering, wandering <laughs> albatross fly in a single journey we had three options all the way around Antarctica, <laughs> 150,000 kilometres, 15,000 kilometres, or 1,500 kilometres. What's the answer? So I have given it away there. 15,000 kilometres is um, uh, that's correct. But also the other answer that is correct is the whole way around Antarctica. So we actually tracked an albatross from Macquarie Island that flew and circumnavigated Antarctica in 237 days. And because um, this species of albatross breeds every second year, uh, it got kind of back to around about where Macquarie Island was. And, and I had a look at the tracking data. I thought, oh, it's going to go back to the island and breed. But no, it decided to do another circumnavigation in 54 days. So I don't know if that's the record, um, but it's pretty incredible um, use of the westerly winds. It's, a, it's better than us <laughs> sailing, isn't it? A couple of other questions that are asked in the poll, and maybe I'll get you to answer them now too. Yeah, I think it's a, a myth that albatrosses mate for life. I mean, they do have very, very long-term hair bonds, and so that's uh, the response that most people gave, but very, very low divorce rates. And, and, you know, what we talked about, climate change influencing that for black browns at the Falklands. Um how about how many chicken how many chicken eggs weigh the same as one wandering albatross egg? I mean, how many of them do you need to make a good omelette? Yeah, not many. Or, or how many um, omelettes can you make with one egg? That's <laughs> So the wandering albatross eggs are around 500 grams. So I said that's about 10 chicken eggs. Um, but that egg, it is just so huge. And it's incredible to see the care that both parents take in looking after that egg. So the female, once she lays it, she is depleted of all her energy stores and she has to go straight to sea to find food. And that male um, will take over that first incubation. And there's a real bond between the male and the egg. And, and often you'll um, see in the field the male actually talking to the egg and singing to the egg. So it's a pretty incredible uh, thing to witness. Thanks very much. Jim, there's a few more questions for you here. Do all whales sing? Uh, generally the singer of the boys. <laughs> singer of the boys. It's more like the four tenors then. That's a Kerry question for <laughs> Kerry. Thanks for that. Um, did you want me to uh, reflect on the poll answers? Yeah. Let's got a few minutes. In regards to blue whales. So, I mean, the one we all want to answer, of course, is 
if we converted the energy that blue whales got from krill each day, how many chocolate cakes would it be equivalent to? So the options were 17, 1,020, 830, or 68. What's the answer? Uh, it's about 830 yummy chocolate cakes. And, and so that's equivalent. Question, where, yeah, which, which chocolate cake? <laughs> Woolworth's mud cake, the big one. <clears throat> Um, it's about equivalent to around 5 million individual krill per day. Uh, when I, so when I reflected on the fact that everything whales do is just a tad too big to comprehend, those are numbers that I can't comprehend. I can't even work out what 830 chocolate cakes is like. Um, the weight of a blue whale is equivalent to 170 small cars, so 170 little Corollas. <laughs> little Corollas. <laughs> is it, a question here from Sue then just to wrap up for for a Davy do penguins eat krill maybe expand on that a bit more as well and what else eats krill yeah um so penguins do eat krill some species of penguins um so for example Adelie penguins are big krill eaters I believe also chin strap penguins are as well um, but there's actually some pretty surprising krill predators as well. So one that I didn't know, if you can picture a leopard seal, you know, the one that just looks like the mean, scary predator with the big teeth. Actually, during the winter, they feed a lot on krill and they actually have teeth that are specially designed to act like a sieve. So they can sieve krill out of the water, kind of like whales do. Um, and then, of course, subspecies of whales and... Probably so the better question to ask secrets. is who doesn't eat krill in the Southern Ocean? <laughs> Only the uncool ones. Fair enough. Ele ele elephant seals and orcas. That's about it. Okay, look, we're almost out of time. So tonight we've heard three stories about how human-induced climate change is impacting the animals of the Southern Ocean. We discussed albatross, krill and whales but we could equally have talked about penguins, seals, or any of the many other animals that live in this unique environment. Whichever species we may wish to highlight, the message is the same. This region is changing, and that environmental change is impacting the lives of the animals that live in the Southern Ocean. Also tonight, we focused on sea ice, but the changes being seen in and around the Antarctic are not limited to sea ice. We're seeing changes in temperature, ocean currents, wind, ocean acidification, and last summer, even rain falling on the continent. So what does the future hold for this region? That is what we as scientists are working hard to determine. For some animals, the changes we predict may be positive, leading to increased populations. For others, the changes may be catastrophic. There have been studies published showing severe declines in species such as emperor penguins by the end of this century. Other animals show that despite significant changes, some species adapt and thrive into the future. One aspect we really struggle to understand is how animal culture plays into a species adaptability. Virginia talked a bit about that, and it's certainly the case in albatross as well with their divorce rates. The larger animals, whales and seals, for example, definitely have a cultural aspect of their foraging. They return to the same place each year and pass this knowledge to their offspring. Rapid change in the environment means mum or dad may well be telling their children out-of-date information. And life as a young Southern Ocean predator is tenuous at best without bad intel from the parents. Then again, we all know kids don't necessarily listen to their parents' advice. So maybe future generations will adapt more quickly than we anticipate. So what can we do? What can you do to help these Southern Ocean animals? The answer is the same as what we can do to help our Australian animals and ourselves. Think about your environmental impact on the earth. What can you do to limit that impact? Individually, the difference each of us can make may be small, but if we begin to value our ecosystems more highly and take collective action, for example, when voting, we can limit the damage we are doing and avoid most of the poor outcomes that scientists, such as us, worry may be coming in the not too distant future. It really is up to us to choose how this plays out. And now, please join me in thanking our guests for this evening, Dr. Jamie Cleland, Dr. Davey Vatia, and Dr. Virginia Andrews-Goff. This evening's talk will be available soon as a video 
and podcast via the university's Island of Ideas website. You can register for upcoming sessions on the Island of Ideas website, or you can use the direct link we've provided in the chat box now. The Island of Ideas series is also available via this site, which is now in your screens. I would strongly encourage you to catch up with some of these earlier excellent talks. Finally, thank you for joining us this evening. We wish you all the best and hope to see you online again soon. On behalf of my fellow speakers and the University of Tasmania, good night.